Okay, this is example two and 7.3 in math 30-1, just looking at some harder questions when we have to change the base. And it, it becomes a very important consideration that, you know, sometimes you have to make the number larger. Like in the first case, you know, four can be, or 64, sorry, can be written as four to the power of three, but both four and 64 can also be written in base two. And the reality is that that doesn't matter. The first thing that I would check is if the larger number can be written as a power of the smaller number. And I want to show that there's an easy-ish way of doing that, that if we look at the number four, then if I want to write the powers of four, I'm just going to keep multiplying by four. So four to the power of one is four. Four to the power of two is four to the power of one times four. So it's 16. Four cubed is 64. Four to the power of four. It's 256, and certainly this pattern would continue. Typically, you don't have to go above 3 and 4, but there's no hard and fast rule for that. Now, changing 64 into a smaller base is also doable. That takes a little more practice. I would recommend that anytime you want to make this list without having to physically do it, remember that if I put y equals 4 to the power of x in my calculator, those nice integer values of x will give me the powers of 4. So that's a good way, I don't want to say cop out, but it's a good way to do this technique um, if we can. Now, the bottom line here is it means that 64 can be substituted or replaced by 4 cubed. So what my equation becomes is I'm not going to touch left-hand side. It's going to be 4 to the power of x plus 2, but my right-hand side is going to be instead of 64, I put in 4 cubed, and then I have an x. Well, what we have to make sure we do is we get a single power to an exponent on each side of the equation. So this is going to become 4 to the power of x plus 2. On the right-hand side, those exponents are going to multiply. Then I get 4 to the power of 3x. At this point, because I have 4 to the power of something equal to 4 to the power of something else, those somethings or those exponents have to be equal to each other to make this work. So we're going to drop that base and say that x plus 2 must be equal to 3x, and then we kind of solve whatever we get. Now, most of the time it's going to be linear, but it is definitely possible that this could be quadratic, or I think on one diploma we had a question like this where it ended up being trigonometric. Um, that's not going to happen very often, um, but it is really important that once there is no variable in the exponent, it is no longer an exponential equation. So we solve it as we normally would. Most students are comfortable with isolating x and getting the answer that x is equal to 1 or 1 is equal to x. Now, like a lot of different questions, it is not a bad idea to verify. Um, if you are solving something algebraically, mathematically, I mean, I would bare minimum verify graphically. Uh, and I'll just write down that technique. You can do that on your own. y1 would be 4 to the power of, in a bracket, x plus 2 y2 would be 64 to the power of x, and then I'll just put here that the solution would be the intersection. And I'll just put intersect. Um, and you would find that those graphs intersect at 1, 64. Um, the other way to verify, and it's a little bit easier, is to plug your answer, x equals 1, into both sides of the original equation. So is 4 to the power of 1 plus 2 equal to 64 to the power of 1? This is 4 to the power of 3 is equal to 64, and that indeed does give me 64 is equal to 64. So we know that that's verified and we've solved it correctly. Please do exploit that ability to do something like that. Um, it is not unique to math, but it's very, very useful, and it allows us to check that we've done things correctly. All right, example B is tougher um, because you cannot write 8 as base 4. And I want to write that again just one more time, that you know, 4 to the power of 1 is 4, then 4 squared is 16, then 4 cubed is 64, and then you know, 4 to the power of 4, I think I put 256. Then that pattern is going to continue. I could look at 8 as well. 8, and then 8 times 8 would be 64. 64 times 8 would be 512. And I'm not going to try to keep going because I'll mess up sooner or later. Neither of those lists have common numbers. I mean, I suppose 64 uh, isn't common. The, the challenge to that, though, is I would have to write, and I'm going to write this down just so we see it, that 8 is equal to 64 to the power of 1 half, and 4 is equal to 64 to the power of 1 third. You can use that, but it's very difficult. Instead, what we should look for, and it's typically 2 or 3, a smaller number that both 4 and 8 can be written as a power of. And this takes practice. This takes a little bit of intuition. And sometimes it takes some guessing and checking. But if I looked at the powers of 2, 2 to the power of 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8. And I'll keep going just for a little bit of posterity. But what's really important is I see 4 in this list, and I see 8 in this list. So I can write 4 as 2 squared. And I can write 8 as 2 cubed. 
And the reason why that's so powerful is it means I can rewrite that equation with both the left-hand side and the right-hand side containing a base two. As soon as we have the ability to do that, we should do so because then we're going to get an equation that we can actually solve via this 7.3 technique. I do want to, at this point, do a little bit of foreshadowing that you will learn a better technique than this. Um, chapter 8 is about the logarithm, and really, the, the I think, the biggest advantage of the logarithm is it allows us to solve exponential equations without changing their base, which is a pretty big advantage because this technique that we're using really only works for these kind of nice integers. Like, what if that was 4.3? You cannot write 4.3 as base 2 without having that logarithm kind of to use. Now, I got a little bit off field there, so I'm going to try to get back to where we are. We are going to take the number 4, replace it with 2 squared, and take the number 8, replace it with 2 cubed. So that means I have 2 squared to the power of 2x is equal to 2 cubed to the power of 2x minus 3. Now, we are going to multiply these exponents. I'm going to write it out that this is 2 to the power of 2 times 2x, is equal to 2 to the power of 3 times, and in a bracket, we put that 2x minus 3. Because it's very important that when we multiply that 3 onto that binomial, 2x minus 3, that that 3 distributes onto both of those terms. And what this turns our equation into is 2 to the power of 4x is equal to 2 to the power that 3 will multiply into both terms. So this is 6x minus 9. But the major advantage is that we do have the common base at this point. Both my left-hand side and my right-hand side have base 2, which means I can drop the base. And what I get when I drop that base is 4x is equal to 6x minus 9, which I then have to solve using a, you know, a math 20 technique, math 10 technique, because it's linear, I suppose. I'm going to isolate my variable. I know a lot of students don't like doing this, but I'm going to subtract 6x from both sides. I get that negative 2x is equal to negative 9. That means that oh, when I divide by negative 2, I get that x is equal to, and I'll write it as a decimal, 4.5. Now, before we go to the next question, I really want to make sure you see that you can verify this. So I'm going to grab my calculator. If you don't have it, you know, pause and, and go grab it. And we're going to make sure that we get the same solution via our calculator as well. All right, hopefully you've grabbed your calculator and you're ready to kind of finish this question off. What we need to do is put the left-hand side in as y1 and the right-hand side is y2. And that's a really, really consistent technique that really is not going to change for solving things graphically. What we need to make sure we do, though, is if the exponent is more complex than a single number, not a single term, a single number, you need to put it in a bracket. So 4 to the power of 2x must be 4 to the power of bracket 2x. Now, if you are running a newer model of the calculator, you might have math print activated. If you have math print on, you don't need to do that. Um, I am going to keep it like this because the classic calculators use this form as well. Y2 is going to be the right-hand side, which is 8 to the power. And again, very, very important to put that you know complex exponent in its own bracket. That is a crucial, crucial thing that a lot of students forget, and then they make that mistake. Now, I don't know what this graph is going to look like, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on Zoom Standard. And what we end up seeing is the blue graph, which is my uh, left-hand side, I suppose. Uh, and then the red graph, which we're, oh, good, we can't see it, is going to be my right-hand side. Now, it's pretty difficult to, to think that these do intersect, right? It looks like they kind of, they're parallel down here, and then they, they stay the same gap. Um, exponential graphs go grow very, very quickly. Um, and if you are stuck trying to find, you know, a proper window setting, I would highly recommend you go to your table and take a look at what happens as X gets big. Look, when X is 2, my blue graph is already at 256, and it keeps getting larger and larger and larger. Now, um, to solve this, what we are going to do is make sure that we just tweak our window settings. And what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to make my max pretty large, and I'm going to go with 10,000. And that is a guess. There's no reason why 10,000 should be the number that we use. But now what we get is a bit of a better look at, you know, the R exponential functions. And more importantly, when that red graph draws here, finally, we're going to see that it does appear that it's kind of closing the gap. Can you see how it's getting closer near the top of the function than is at the bottom? I'm still not seeing where that intersection is. Now, some students will blindly trust their calculators, or they'll, you know, hit trace and put 4.5 in. And you can check your answer, right? When I put 4.5 in for Y1, I get 262,144. If I go up onto the red graph and I put 4.5 in, oops, I didn't hit up at the right time. I'm just going to get out of that. So if I hit trace and hit up to my red function y2, if I type in 4.5, you're going to see a pretty familiar looking number, right? They have the same value. I like to see that intersection. 
So knowing that happens at 262,000 is actually pretty important because it means I'm going to make this what I kind of felt was ridiculously large, but 500,000. And now when I graph it, we will actually see that intersection point because it's only happening at 262,000. So we went kind of twice as big as we needed to. So now looking at that red graph, we will see that it's below the blue function. And then all of a sudden near the top, it looks like it's above the blue function. That means they had to cross somewhere in here. To find that solution, it's second trace option number five, which is the intersect. Um, and then I like to put my cursor where I think the intersect is, and then just kind of hammer on enter three times, which is always a nice technique. So somewhere in there, my first curve is Y1, that's good. My second curve is Y2, that's good. And then the guess, it, unless there's multiple intersections, it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to hit enter. And it tells me that my intersection or the solution is when X is equal to 4.5. So I really do think that if you're solving something and you have a little extra time, um, you should check it on your calculator or check it on Desmos or, you know, any graphing utility will do this. But it's really important that something as concrete and as direct as solving something algebraically, it's very, very worth verifying or confirming, I guess, with a graph as well.